Hey, ladies, I'm so excited to bring you part two of our Marriage Ask Us Anything podcast. If you haven't had a chance to listen to part one, episode 23, you might want to stop here, go listen to that one, because we're really just going to pick up where we left off. And where we left off was talking about sex. So if you're ready, let's go. Welcome to the Health, Life, and More for Women podcast with certified health and life coach, mom of four, and just all around lover of all things 80s, your host, Jennifer D'Amato. Buckle in, let's get started. Hey, ladies, um, just want to kind of put this out there that if you happen to be listening to this part two of the podcast with little kiddos around, you might want to hit pause or grab your headphones because we're continuing the discussion about um, sex in our marriage. You ready? I'm ready. Let's do this. All right. So my husband is still here for this podcast because we're answering all the questions about marriage and relationship that we've gotten. And where we ended part one, we were talking about um, this idea of a crock pot and a microwave. And a microwave. (laughs) We should probably explain that um, it's not an actual crock pot and microwave. We're not some weirdo. (laughs) Uh, But we have had this lesson I'd say, I think it's been taught to us three times, but something we really like clung on to as a foundation for um, considering being intimate in our relationship. Yes, for sure. So I'm the crock pot. And I'm the microwave. (laughs) All right. What that really means and how it was taught to us is women, generally speaking, are a crock pot. And if you've ever used a crock pot, you know that you turn that sucker on in the morning on low and it cooks all day long. So that by the time you get home for dinner, your meal is good to go. It's ready. Conversely, a microwave, you stick that food in there, hit go, and in two minutes, it's ready. (laughs) It's ready to go. Straight from the freezer to the microwave and dinner. (laughs) And generally... That is the male in the relationship. I actually have had conversations with women where they don't feel that, like it's opposite for them. But in, I would say, general terms, it's, you know, a woman is a crock pot needing to be nurtured and loved and um, warmed up all day. And the man, a husband, is generally pretty good to go at the be, you know, couple of minutes. Hey, how you doing? (laughs) How appropriate that we're talking about kitchen utensils here. (laughs) Why is that appropriate? Or appliances, uh, rather. Why why is it appropriate that we're talking about kitchen appliances? Well, sex starts in the kitchen. Oh, (laughs) we were also taught that too, weren't we? (laughs) It starts in the kitchen. Oh my goodness gracious. Okay. I have what I was saying before I was distracted by this cute man next to me was I have talked to um, at least one woman who it was the opposite for her, except there was still one of each. There's not two crock pots generally or two microwaves. Maybe when we're like newly married, early 20s for some people, they're both feeling like microwaves. I but um, so this idea is what we were taught was I needed, and it was so true, I needed to be um, wooed turned on warm, feeling warm all day long to want to be intimate at the end of the day, to be ready at the end of the day. Um, Whereas you just didn't need as much to... I would say that's correct. Okay. And I would say it's still fairly true today. Maybe not as extreme as that, but it's still pretty true today. Yes. And we had to find some creative ways to make that happen for us, that crock pot warming well you've had to find some there were some lessons learned (laughs) i have to say for the most part having these smartphones on us all the time is a negative like they're so distracting except we have found a way to use it to our advantage in our marriage where you send text messages throughout the day yes and i'd say that starts with uh well, now, not as much that we're at the same gym together in the mm-hmm. morning, 
But uh, it used to be when we worked out at separate gyms, I would send you a message as soon as I got to the gym and yep. uh, just an encouraging word or something that I loved you and was looking forward to hanging out with you in the evening. Yeah, it really has. That's made a difference. Even when we discovered those um, bitmojis, <laughs> I mean, seriously, like teenagers over here and sending each other, you know, hubba hubba ones and big hearts and love you to infinity and all those love things. Love you to the moon and back. Yes, yes. So that has been part of the crock pot for us now is those messages because the reality is your days are especially busy. I mean, they're always busy, but really when you're, we can't even get on the phone at all during the yeah. day to talk. Even on those days, you find a way to send a, I'm just thinking of you, or I love you, or a heart, or something yeah, to me. Yeah, sometimes it's just between meetings, quickly jumping on there, shooting you a text message. Hey, thinking about you, I love you, can't wait to see you tonight. Yeah, and that's something you have to be intentional, though. Absolutely. Intentional, and have to have that thought throughout the day that um, I need to warm the crock pot and prevent it from being shut off. So mm. uh, part of that is messaging you, communicating with you, talking to you, um, sending you pictures of the clean sink if you're <laughs> out and I'm at home. Uh-huh. Yep, definitely, definitely. And there's been other things. I'd say that's the most consistent thing that we've done to for the crock pot method, especially since we had set the frequency goal for 2019 though you were doing it before then anyway just I had communicated again the theme is communication I had communicated that I needed that that I needed to hear from you that I needed um that connection throughout the day because we went through the, the season where you would just come home we really hadn't talked or anything or, or it was like all business kids stuff work stuff nothing about the two of us and then expect to get in bed and be excited to see one another. It just wasn't happening. No, it wasn't happening. Well, it, it wasn't happening on my end. Most of the time it was it was definitely on me. But it wasn't until really communicating the specifics of what would make that different, which was I need to hear from you throughout the day and not about work and me complaining about the kids or being tired from that or house stuff or whatever. It had to be just about the two of us. Just the two <laughs> of us. I'm not the only one who breaks out in song in the closet on the podcast, just saying. What we were talking about when, when I was thinking about sharing this piece was because the topic when I put out the questions was um, was asked about how do you invest in your marriage? And this is just one of the ways that we invest in it is actually being really intentional with communicating during the day um, about non- I don't know, like life stuff. It's just about, hey, hubba hubba. <laughs> How you doing? I mean, that's that's really something that we had to be intentional about doing and communicate that we both needed. But we're also really intentional um, in investing in our marriage by dating. Yeah. And I think I want to back up one step before we get into the dating. Uh, I've heard the analogy of your relationship as like an ATM. Um, where if you don't make any deposits into it, you're only going to get so many withdrawals before you have no money in the account. So I think it's really important that you take the steps in being intentional to make investments and deposits into your relationship for those times of withdrawal. Oh, I like that analogy a lot. I like the ATM. Cha-ching. <laughs> um, okay. So uh, speaking of investing, though, let's go back there because, and that's part of investing, right? I mean, we could probably go into a total money analogy as far as investing and compounding interest. Ooh, and all. Compounding interest. <laughs> we could totally go into that. But again, the question was posed about how do you invest? And what David's talking about is totally right. Just making those deposits. One of the ways is that communication. And the another way is dating. Dating listening. Yeah. They're all, I think, key components of being present in your relationship for your spouse. Awesome. So the question was, it was so simple. How do we do it? N the dating. <laughs> Bard. Oh, <laughs> How do we go about dating one another? So 
if you listen to part one, you know that we've been together for 22 years. We've been married for 18 and a half of those years. We have four kids. And I will say dating's easier now than it was five years ago, even. I mean, having teenagers and not needing to coordinate a babysitter is a game changer. I, I mean, yes. if I, I just have to be really upfront about that um, because that just, it created some unique opportunities um, to really figure out financially how we were going to be able to date or um, if we could even go out because we, we babysitters fall through. It just was a lot more work. Yeah, and dating doesn't have to be going out. It's looked different at different times in our relationship or seasons of our relationship. Uh, I would say, you know, when we had young ones in the house, it was um, getting them ready for bed, putting them to bed, and then taking some time to watch a blockbuster oh, yes. VHS or DVD. Gosh, we're dating ourselves seriously by mentioning blockbuster on here right now. Um, you know, more in recent years, it's been Netflix, uh, watching a movie or watching a TV show that we both enjoy. Um, it can be just taking a walk together through the neighborhood. I mean, we've even done that with the kids. Yeah, but we started even when they were just old enough to be alone for a little bit. That's what we started doing was walking in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. It gave them practice and gosh, we could talk without being interrupted, which is part of the whole reason for going on a date, isn't it? I mean, is to talk without interruption. Um, at least it was when our kids were little because there's always little ears around. Um, so we would do that. I can remember we had little ones and no money. And it it was blockbuster movies and even eating dinner at like 7.30 at night when the kids had gone to bed and we wouldn't eat till then. And that was our date. Mm -hmm. I mean... So we've always dated. I will say that that's something we've been pretty consistent with. It hasn't been something we've had to come back to. And that's, I would say, part in seeing other people not doing it and the negative effects of not dating, we had decided early on to continue dating. Yes, definitely. I, I mean, looking at my parents who are divorced uh, and other couples who don't seem to be uh, highly functioning or have a healthy relationship, if you will. Uh, one of the key things that I noticed early on was that they did not appear to be dating and that there was kind of a disinterest, just uh, kind of the husband had pursued the wife. He had achieved his goal, won his prize, and that's where it ended. Um, but in men who had very healthy relationships and openly demonstrated affection towards their wife, uh, which is not just public displays of affection, but just loving on, encouraging, speaking highly about a, a spouse. Uh, it was a key component. They were dating their wife. They were pursuing their wives no matter what, encouraging their wives. Um, and that was, I'd say, instrumental for me to observe that at a pretty young age and uh, even continuing to observe through men who uh, love their wives, um, that dating is very important and the pursuit goes on. Yeah. And it's better now. I mean, actually leaving and, and again, we set a goal for this year. We, oh, well, last, last year, year. <laughs> for 2019, we had set a goal to go on a date every week. We did really good. We kind of kicked some serious butt at that goal, I have to say, because the only times we ever missed, I think you were traveling out of the country which makes it really hard to go on a date. Um, and I think a couple other, I don't know if it was sick or, you know, something had come up, but really we sometimes just move the date to a different time, which, you know, fit in a breakfast date or something. So we really, out of the entire year, may have missed two weeks. That was yeah, it. That was awesome. That was really awesome. So the logistics of it, I'll tell you right now, because I know the question was asked of how we logistically do that is we put it in the calendar. So we have a family calendar in Google and it is in there every single Saturday night at 6.30, it might be 5.30, 6.30. I don't know what the time is. That's kind of irrelevant. But we have it set as an appointment every single week. And what's great about that is on the times where we've had to move the date night, maybe it's to a Friday because we can't do the Saturday or I can literally just 
drag it in the calendar, but it's set in there. So when somebody says, oh, are you free on Saturday to do X, Y, Z or whatever? I'm like, oh, we have date night that night. So then I have to have a conversation like, hey, do you want to move date night to Friday or go on a Saturday morning one? Because this is coming up. Um, We are already prepared for it. It's already something we're doing. And we communicated it to our kids. I mean, they're probably... they know it's date night. I think they look forward to it sometimes more than we do. I think they look forward to it because they get to eat pizza on date night, like every single date night. <laughs> I'm pretty sure they eat pizza and they do get to play video games and watch TV and just kind of run the place. Yep. Yes. I do think they look forward to it as well. Um, at first, it was a transition for them that we were doing it consistently out, not staying home, that we were going out. But yeah, I, they're on board too. And we actually had the whole discussion with them explaining why we're doing it. Because the reality is, you know, if you don't invest in the two of you, when all the kids are gone and the house is finally quiet and you're those empty nesters and you don't, you don't, I know you don't think that's coming, but it's coming faster than we want it to it's going to be just the two of you. And if you've spent no time investing in the two of you, there's probably not going to be a very successful two of you. No, it's going to be very difficult. A lot of parents are defining themselves by their children or their children's activities. And uh, remember, it started with two of you. Mm -hmm. Uh, You need to continue to work on that relationship between the two of you so that when there is just the two of you again, you can still be friends and still have fun with each other. Absolutely. Um, Another question that was posed was, um, I don't know if it's really a question, but she had written in, a woman had written in saying that he used to plan the dates, you know, when they were dating. You were kind of talking about this before, and now she really does want him to do that. I I believe we want to be wooed. I know I want to be wooed still and, um, you know, have you plan dates and take me out. Um. What advice would you give another husband who's um, stopped planning those dates? Ooh, I'd say, what did you like or what did your spouse like to do on dates before you were married? Uh, Is that still a possibility? What are new interests between the two of you? And what is the end goal? What do you want to achieve by dating your wife? Um, you know, what are you going to invest and what is the return that you're looking for? Mm, That's really good. And I, I mean, I, when I look at that, I think about dating as building our friendship or continuing to build and deepen and grow our friendship as long, you know, I mean, I like the wooed part and all of that, but going on dates, you know, is when you do, you get to reconnect and talk and, um, ask questions without being interrupted. So I look at that as the friendship piece in yeah. dating. Friendship for sure. I mean, ultimately, you still want to be friends when it's just the two of you again. Oh, gosh, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I refer to David as my best friend because he is. And that's something we highly value is our friendship. Because let's be honest, there are times where love is hard. Yes. There are times where we're just not even liking each other at all. But we have that friendship there and we know that we're committed to this. So it's important and we can endure some of the difficult seasons. (laughs) And high volume discussions. And high volume discussions. (laughs) Yes. But that really does speak to our friendship and the value of being friends. I mean, if you guys think about your closest female friend and how much you invest in that relationship and you listen to her and you um, spend time and you call her on the phone, you check in all the things that we're talking about here need to be done in your marriage as well. Absolutely. Awesome. Okay. I have another question that was given to us um, by a woman. Her name is Julie. And she asked, is it healthy In a long-term marriage, I don't know if that means like you've been married for a long term, you know, you've been married for a while. I'm assuming that's what it means. Okay, so is it healthy in a marriage for your spouse to have a, quote, work wife? Oh, this is an interesting question. And I want to define because, you know, when I looked at this question, I want to just make sure we're all on the same page about what a work wife is. 
So the way I view that, and David has, does have females he works with, so it would be as if he spends a lot of time, you know, working with a coworker who's a female, they're working on projects all the time, they have to, they have to travel or any of that stuff, and he, you know, spends a significant amount of time with her and refers to her as his work wife because of the length of time they spend together at work, right? Right. So my initial impression of this question is to enter with caution. Um, I think my female colleagues are a great resource for giving me perspective um, about things that are happening at work. But I would use caution if you're referencing your work wife or a female colleague for uh, relationships with other females, relationships with your spouse. That's an area that I think is a danger zone. Um, for males at, at the office and in general. Um, I mean, I've worked with several female colleagues. I've been in different departments and worked with different females and uh, relationships at work have grown between them. Um, we're friends with some of them outside of work as a couple, but at no point have I used those relationships to confi confide in a female associate ab about my marriage or ask questions about my marriage. And in general, I reserve that to mentor couples. And at that approach, I would either ask the male or I would ask them as a couple for uh, some counsel or some advice. But uh, anyway, no. long, long story short, I think it's a, it's a gray zone and you need to be really cautious on how you approach the advice that uh, you're getting from female colleagues as a male. At, at work. And as the wife, I would say if the the wife the uh, is not comfortable with the term or the um the relationship, that's an easy this is not a good idea. Absolutely. Um because that relationship should come first before any of those other relationships. Um I will tell you guys that for David and I, we have some, I don't know, ground rules is the right term as far as opposite um, sex um, when we're around them. That, you know, other than work situations where I wouldn't say it's unavoidable, but you're just very aware of it or I am aware. You let me know what's going on. We don't put ourselves in a position to be alone with someone of the opposite sex that's not our spouse. Yeah. And that's really just something we agreed upon. I know that there's other people who would scoff at that and think that's totally ludicrous. But honestly, it saved us from any of those issues ever being an issue for us. We just don't put ourselves in that position. We're honest that the world is tempting. We're honest that we're both human beings. And um, there's so many opportunities to be tempted with other things in this world that we've just decided why put ourselves in a place where we're going to be intentionally? Like, why would we do that to ourselves? Um, we've seen marriages break up with that. We've seen destruction. We've seen all of that. And it breaks our heart. And we just, again, we decided early on that we would not put ourselves in those positions. And David's very upfront um, because he's more in the situation, more likely to be in that situation with a female coworker that he just doesn't ever put himself in the position if he doesn't have to be, you know, one on one. And I always know who they are. You know, he's so upfront with me. And that's just, again, part of our communication. I'm not a jealous person, um, but I do like to know <laughs> who they are. And here's the thing. And I always tell him this. It's because David's amazing. Like, he's the guy that listens and makes you feel amazing. And um, he's just so present I could imagine any <laughs> female going, oh my goodness, you're so amazing. So I don't want him to be put in that position ever. Um, and it really just guards our marriage. But we yeah. set that forth. Again, that was something I credit to the premarital counseling and that class that we were in, you know, our uh, just married class that we were in, that we safeguarded our marriage that way. We had amazing mentors right up front from the beginning that from their experiences without doing those things or knowing, you know, others that hadn't taught us, this is what we recommend. 
And again, those were discussions we had, and then we decided to put those things in place early on. Yeah, and I'd say that this reminds me of the quote of, if you fail to prepare, you prepare to fail. And I'd say having those conversations, putting those ground rules uh, into effect, and also having my spouse know who my female colleagues are um, is, is helpful in our relationship. Hey ladies, just wanted to take a pause here in this episode for a moment because I understand we're talking a lot about communication and maybe you're thinking, gosh, I just struggle so much. I have these conversations and I try and they just go nowhere. I want to turn you to episode number 10. It's my number one conversation hack. If you haven't had a chance to listen to that episode, go ahead and grab that one, download it to listen to. It really is going to change how you enter into conversations. All right, let's hop back in to the rest of our discussion about marriage, parenting, relationships, all the good stuff with my hubby, David. All right, you ready for the last question? All right, let's go. All right, the last question that we're going to answer on the podcast is, how did you agree on parenting styles or the upbringing of your children? Do we have enough time in this podcast to answer that? (laughs) All right, let me just kind of preface this with saying we were brought up very differently, two very different homes. Um, I was brought up, you know, my parents are still married to this day. I have, I'm a middle child and, um, there was, I don't know, very traditional, I thought very traditional upbringing home. Both my parents worked, um, after my mom, you know, was done having kids and, um, yours was very different. Mm, Very different. Uh, I am the product of a divorced home. Uh, My parents divorced when I was 13 years old, but even before that, um, before I even knew there was marital strife, Um, and I am the oldest uh, of two brothers, myself and my younger brother, Um, and it's just, I spent most of my time growing up in a house living with my mother and her parents. Um, which was very unique, having three adults or three parents in the house as well. Yeah. So even though we had very different upbringings, one thing that we both saw as a common theme, though, was reactive parenting. Mm. There was a lot of reactive parenting. And what that means is really, you know, your kids do something and all of a sudden you react to it and have to make a rule or figure out what you're going to do. And as a kid who figured my parents out on that one pretty early on, it's a it's a bad place to be. So one thing we decided when I would say our oldest, she was three. So at that, you know, at that point, we still had that um, that leeway where she wasn't making any independent decisions and we were doing everything. You know, she's three. Although at three, there's a lot of independent decisions. Uh, <laughs> she thought there was anyway. There was not. But we decided to take something we've called a proactive parenting approach. So, I mean, again, they're going to hear this. We sat down and talked about it. Like we actually sat down and talked about some, I don't know, I called them big ticket items for parenting in how we were going to approach things that came to um, discipline and milestone upbringings. We do have all girls, so it was it is unique to that. We actually sat down, I have it written down, it's in my um, side table, you know, when we would allow them to wear makeup, um, have cell phones, go on dates, you know, and I'll tell you, it's all in pencil because we acknowledge that you just don't know what life is going to bring. Um, we actually did the cell phone thing with our oldest earlier than we thought we would, Yeah. though. That it, was some unique circumstances, I think. It was. It was. And we still, we decided no social media, which yeah. is still the case. However, we decided to take this proactive approach. I I remember bringing this to David, and this is, of course, so long ago, but I can remember the part where I said, I want to discuss these things before we ever get there. I don't want to be surprised. I mean, I'll, I, there's still a level of surprise, I think, when it happens and you're like, oh my gosh, how are we here? And time goes by so fast, but not surprised that we didn't already have a plan. Our oldest knew by the age of 12, 13, when she even would care, maybe, that yeah. she couldn't date till she was 17. I know some of you out there. I think there, that was one of the first decisions that we came to yeah. uh, when we started this discussion. Yeah. And I know people are probably gasping at that thinking we're crazy, but 
There's good reason behind it, which we're not going to get into in this podcast. It all has to do with me. But it was something, again, it took some long discussion because originally that age was 16. Yeah, it, part of it was from a movie that we watched. Um, but also, I think that we landed at 17 because 15 and 16 are, are big years. Yeah, big So years. why add additional stress and challenges to life why not delay it for another year and give an opportunity for something else to look forward to another milestone in life and that was the other part we agreed upon is we wanted our kids to have things to look forward to we actually wanted them to anticipate things and again you know when our oldest was 10 and 11 and 12 she didn't care a lick about makeup like she just never cared she was in um productions of the nutcracker and wore stage makeup all the time and hated it it's so thick and gross and just didn't care while she knew very early on these discussions happened and we already had this proactive plan that when she was 15 she would be able to you know wear makeup on a, you know a regular basis if you will not for for performances and <laughs> It's so funny because she's literally counting down the days to wear makeup now mm -hmm. because she's getting closer and closer to 15. And for the last six months, all of a sudden, because it's coming and she gets to anticipate it. You know, we we saw even 15 years ago, almost 15 years ago, you know, we're getting ready to have our first baby. Life was moving fast. And this is when, I mean, we're not even talking like Facebook and Instagram. None of that existed where you feel like that's almost making it feel faster. But we felt it was coming fast. So we wanted to um, not rush their childhood. We both agreed on that as well. Yeah, I, I think even looking back at our past that, you know, at the age that we started working, that we saw we wanted a, something a little bit different for our kids. And part of that was planning out, you know, uh, those discussions of when wearing makeup, when to start dating, but also um, with homeschooling and, and schooling and what we wanted their primary focus to be uh, and to just let them be young for as long as possible. Yeah, that was definitely something we valued from our own childhood because we didn't have all the stuff from today that we got to be kids and play outside and ride our bikes and scrape our knees and eat mud pies. Maybe that was just my house. <laughs> I tried to eat worms. Oh, gosh, help us all. But we wanted our kids to experience that. So that was what we discussed early on. And then we developed the proactive parenting plan, if you will. And again, I can't say this enough that it's in pencil. That's something I firmly believe about everything in life is that you have to use pencil because you don't know what life is going to bring. Um, however, we wanted this plan. And it's something we've shared with the girls as they've gotten older. Yeah, for sure. I mean, again, common theme of communication. It's they understood from an early age that there were milestones that were coming up in their life and that they had something to look forward to. And that we were not necessarily going to uh, give up on those specific time frames that we were searching for, despite uh, Jennifer saying everything's in pencil. That's more of a planning for us. You know, we have the ability to move things, but we want to give them an opportunity to have those things to look forward to in life. And I'd say our oldest even presented an argument for the cell phone, which is why she yep. she got it earlier than she did, um, which is why it was in pencil. Which I'll tell you was a 10 point like presentation. <laughs> I don't want you to think she just came to us and said, I want a cell phone. Everyone, it was, it actually had some convincing points on it. Um, and sh that actually, I don't think the cell phone was, um, something we were upset about changing that and, and making that, that shift just due to who she is. Um, but that plan has really helped us as, like a, a guiding, not a set in stone, but just kind of helping guide us, give the girls some sort of plan. They're not willy nilly either. And again, the reactive parenting that, you know, I, I would say most people grew up with. It wasn't like a, that was unique to us, but that type of parenting style had some major negative effects on me for sure. And when I brought those to the table early on, I saw the gaps and I said, we just had to sit down and brainstorm, well, how can we fill those gaps? How can we actually do things differently 
So it feels like not always that we're ahead of the game because having kids, you never feel no. ahead of the game, but how can we feel on the same page and that we've done some planning for the future? Yeah. And also what outcomes were we looking to achieve by setting these milestones or setting these limitations? For example, with social media, our, our girls are not on social media other than Pinterest um, but we just see how negativity can enter, uh, environment and bullying and all these other things. And like we said before, we want them to stay kids for a little while longer. So that's our, that was one of our primary objectives was how to keep their innocence, uh, as long as possible, because at some point they're going to grow up and the world is going to enter it. And they're going to have to deal with all the crap that we deal with as adults but why not let them be kids for as long as possible? Yeah, and you know, entering into this season of raising teenagers now definitely is different than toddlers. And we listen a lot more to them now. And that's something I even, I can remember a recent discussion with you, David, about we have to make that space for them as much as we hate them coming in every single night to talk. Um, a great mentor of mine had told us it was going to happen when they turned, you know, into teenage years. They only like to talk at night. I don't know. Is that like werewolves only come out at night or something? <laughs> I don't know. But they come in our room to talk then. And what comes out of those discussions actually just feeds our discussions of um, where things are, where we want them to go. How can we we can both help them in in our own unique ways um, and as their parents collectively but we've had to actually make some shifts and adjustments. We didn't even know it was coming because until you're there, you don't know. But because we allow space for them to also communicate with us. I mean, I'm not going to lie. I'm sure our oldest, she wants to be on Instagram. Oh, definitely. All her friends are following you and I on Instagram. So. <laughs> yeah, they definitely do. They, I mean, and we hear her. And we also, again, because we've already had those discussions about why we don't, we can, we're on the same page about you know, why she's not doing it. So we can both answer that. Our kids know you can't ask dad him say no and come to mom. And she says, yes, they know that for the most, yeah. and not, I'm not talking about silly things like, can I make popcorn or can I have some ice cream? I'm talking about the bigger stuff. They, they know that we're on the same page. Um, and if, if we haven't discussed it, there is something that comes that we're just not sure, you know, how we want to handle it. I'll, t I have no problem tabling it. I have no problem saying, you know, I'm going to wait, I'm going to talk to your dad, and I'll get back to you. So we've also had that. And I would say you've done that same thing if I haven't been around in those rare instances. Oh, yeah, for sure. They they definitely know that they're not going to be able to pit us against each other, that if it comes to some type of bigger decision, I'm not going to say just big decisions, but bigger decisions, um, that we're going to talk to each other about it before we arrive at a an answer. Uh, to get back to them. Yeah. So I guess I'm hoping that we're answering that, but I, what I want to make sure I wrap this up with is it's about communication. And if you haven't kind of gotten that between episode 23, part one, and this episode is it's, we communicate about everything. I mean, whether it's, you know, parenting stuff, it's our jobs, it's sex, it's money, it's, you know, house things went, we talk a lot. I mean, David's kind of screwed because I'm just a talker anyway. So he may have been a quiet person once upon a time, but we do talk. We do talk a lot. And we talk, we talk about the future. Mm -hmm. We talk about what we've learned from the past. Yep. Um, lessons that we've learned and how we want to approach things differently from how we were raised and how things happened for us through different seasons of our life so that we can hopefully learn from them and do things differently and do them better. Yeah, definitely. You know, and the reality is everything that we're doing right here between the two of us doesn't just affect us. It affects four future spouses. Mm -hmm. And I mean, if you think about that, it can affect eight future spouses, eight future marriages. And that doesn't even include any other couples that we've had the opportunity to counsel or advise or love on or be friends with. or Like we realize the impact we have the opportunity to have with our marriage being successful. I mean, 
I, I carry that in my heart with me that if we have success here and if we work through the good, the bad, the ugly, if we do all of that, um, even if it's not, it's, it's not about being perfect. It's never been about no. being perfect. Far from perfect. But if we show up and we keep showing up and we keep communicating about all these things, we have an opportunity to influence so many other marriages down there. I mean, that's what I look at, especially the four that are in our house, that they're listening. They're listening and watching all the time, all <laughs> the time, which is why you need to go on those dates or take those walks where there's no one around. Um, but they are observing and listening and we want to be that example for them. But we also know we have an opportunity to be an example for others. And just based on the questions that we got and, and so many questions that we got, we know there's a need for it. And marriage has always been on our heart just to be an example, to share, because we've been blessed by so many other marriages that have sown into our marriage that we just kind of want to pour it out to others. Yeah, for sure. I mean, for me, it was observing men when I was a teenager to when we first uh, got engaged in Detroit and uh, watching our pastors, how they treated their wives there to coming to Phoenix and our uh, just married Sunday school class, having those people pour into us. I'd say those were highly valuable experiences and, and also having mentors in our life to just, you know, people who are ahead of you who can give you that advice of, you know, hey, I didn't do it right, but maybe you should consider doing it this way or this worked really well for me. You know, why don't you consider consider adding that or doing that that this way. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. And if we can pay it forward to even one other couple, you know, outside of this house, if we can pay it forward, then we're going to we're going to show up and do that for them. So, this was fun. Did you enjoy it? I enjoyed it. <laughs> I enjoyed being in the closet for this long. I mean, we're talking like total recording time and prepping time like 2 hours without anybody coming in. Well, the dog came in between episodes. Yes, the dog came in, but was soon kicked out. And That's it, right. He didn't ask for anything. He didn't <laughs> interrupt anything. He put, oh, I would have just sat there. Um, and I'm pretty proud of us for not pausing, like, repeatedly and making out. We did a good job. We did a good job. But we probably should stop this and go make out. Let's go make out. All right. Thanks for joining us. Until next week, ladies. Hey ladies, want to connect with me outside of this podcast? Come follow along on Instagram at Jennifer underscore health coach for life. That's Jennifer underscore health coach, the number four life. You can also connect with me on Facebook. Just search Jennifer coach, the number four life. I also want to help you take your health both physical and mental, to the next level. I want you to feel empowered. I want you to reclaim your body's intuition. If that's for you and you're ready for support and accountability like you've never had before, then why not book a free consultation with me by visiting my website, www.healthcoachforlife.com. That's www dot health coach the number four life dot com slash request session. I've also made it really easy by including a link in the show notes below. For any questions about the podcast or to submit a question or topic you would like discussed here, you can email me at Jennifer Damato Podcast at gmail.com.